um, our factory um, deals with one of the world's largest brands, and we um, we kind of, I guess, enjoy uh, the benefits of their research and whatnot. Um, so we're seeing a lot of changes in CCTV. Obviously, it's a growing market, as most of you guys know. Um, and we're seeing the tra transition away from analog from maybe two years ago um, to other coaxial systems. And right now, we're making a transition to IP systems. I'm talking globally. Um, and as a part of that transition, we're seeing um, the benefits of IP being these super high resolutions. But interestingly, we're seeing all of these benefits of analytics. So a day in which we're no longer you know, looking at computer screens, um, computer screens are giving us, um, you know, what do they call it, big data? A lot of feedback telling us, you know, this person shouldn't be here, they're over there. Someone left a package over here. Um, facial recognition, there's a fire, you know, it will recognize a fire as opposed to other objects. So we're seeing all of these kinds of benefits of analytics, um, as well as that we're seeing all these battles between you know, increasingly um, processes, networks that are getting stressed and whatever else. So trying to understand cameras has probably never been so important. Um, and I hate to, hate to say it, but Paul Ben, He's pretty good with this kind of stuff, so please tune in and uh, enjoy the session. Cool. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Thanks, Mike. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Marshall. I've worked for Radio Parts, and I have done for about 12 years now. Um, for whatever sins I've, you know, I've committed in a previous life, I'm supposedly an expert on CCTV. <laughs> so I've devised a bit of a general purpose training this morning, mostly you know, looking at the cameras, the technology, and I guess the cabling. You know, the boring stuff for it all, but this is the stuff to get important and get right first. And this drives whatever you're going to do at the back end with recorders, and back up and so on from there. All right, so let's get in and enjoy it, I hope. Um, I always start with this because I think it's important to look at why a CCTV system might be necessary in the first place. And so if you want to know about crime, you ask criminals. Um, the short answer to most of this stuff is uh, criminals who break into somebody's house or property or whatever else like that come in a couple of different varieties. There are some who are determined for whatever reason. That could be need money, need uh, stuff from your house. That could be the 84 inch OLED panel that's up on the wall, whatever it might be. They're desperate and they, you've got what they want and CCTV is not going to stop them because they're just, they need the stuff more than they worry about getting caught. Those sort of guys, you'll never do much to really stop them except for a pit bull and a shotgun. Um, maybe even not a pit bull. Rottweiler, well trained, German shepherds, talk to Abby and I'm sure she can get that sorted out for you. Other type of criminals will see a CCTV system and go, you know what, this is a pain in the ass, I can't be bothered. I'm going to go down the street to the next suburb to somewhere else where I'm not going to be seen on camera because somebody else is going to have what I want and they're not going to catch me on camera when that happens. So it's important to know that. Um, it's also important to remember that if I broke into somebody's house today, and I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm here, I'm enjoying myself with you, but if I was, and they had perfect vision of my face, if I haven't left a fingerprint there that is on record, if they haven't left my license plate, which is on record, how are they gonna catch me? Do a police know what I look like versus anybody else? You know, in an identity kit, they might walk past me on the street and go, hang on, that guy in the glasses, he looks like the guy that knocked over the liquor store. Well, that might happen. But if they don't have me on file or on record, it's very difficult to convict somebody of it. So having the most perfect vision in the world doesn't necessarily mean you're going to catch somebody. Yeah. Driving license may help, depending on how the systems are set up. But again, my driver's license is from a long time ago now. I look a little bit different than I did then. So just keep that in mind for your customers. It's not a perfect solution. But for people who don't feel safe in their own home, for people who value their own personal, pro, you know, personal things, for businesses that want to catch, an, you know, catch employees stealing from them, or in our case, the primary use for CCTV isn't to catch somebody, it's to see whether that order did go out that it was supposed to go out, that that truck turned up at the time they said they turned up. You know, those sort of things are much more useful. So the analytics and the actual vision side of things can be more valuable to a business than having a perfect image of somebody taking something off a shelf. So the statistics from this are a little bit old. Um, 
there will be a copy of this on our company intranet and online so you can look through it a little bit later. But it's basically what I was saying in the statistics version. So let's look at the CCTV market today. I consider there's two types of products. There's consumer level products and there's pro install products. So let's break them down just a little bit further. Consumer level products, I have a few of them. Uh, Radio Parts sells quite a few. There are a number of different brands out there on the market. So people like Netgear have come out with their new Arlo, uh, Wi-Fi, CCTV, everything kind of kit. TP-Link does a lovely little camera like this one that connects into Wi-Fi. They've got a pan, tilt and zoom one here. These are really neat little products. They don't require much in the way of setup. You just get this connected to your network via Wi-Fi or cable, download the app, find the thing via the app, and then you can view it. You know, they take advantage of consumer level networking to make these things as easy as possible to make and run. So the little Edimax one that's over there is a door camera. Put that over the top of a door so it doesn't require any screws or anything else there and you've got a beautiful vision of somebody walking up to your door and the app will tell you when they're there, you can communicate through it and all sorts of other cool stuff like that. And that's a consumer level product that has a great market. Anybody walking in can pick up one of those, take it home and you know, install it themselves quite easily. Um, same with the little TP-Link. You know, same with the bigger TP-Link one here and any of the other ones that are out in the market. But the big thing that they're designed to take advantage of is Wi-Fi. And as we all know, Wi-Fi is not always as good as Wi-Fi could be. So upgrading people's homes with better Wi-Fi is a definite priority. The more devices we add, particularly cameras that are streaming high resolution video at multi frames per second, that can be a right pain on your network. So keeping that working well is very important. Um, but somebody who buys one of these things may not think about that. They may just pick it up off a shelf and go, 150 bucks and I get a camera. Take it home, plug it in, and then wonder why they can't stream Netflix anymore. So it's important to know those sort of things about a consumer level device. A pro level device almost invariably is going to be cabled. Whether it's data cable or coax cable or anything else that I'll talk about later, cabling is king for those sort of systems. With a consumer level device, you can see from both of those ones, the resolutions are actually quite low. 720p, 480p is about standard because that won't overload your network too much. These guys are trying to trade off between the highest resolution they can versus bringing down somebody's consumer you know, modem from Telstra or wherever by putting too much video through. It's important to think about that as part of the system. These sort of cameras can sometimes have local storage and that takes the form of micro SD cards on the back of them in most cases. So if somebody rips out the camera, they rip out your storage and goodbye to any footage that you might have. The other thing with a lot of the storage capacities on these is that it can be quite small might be a maximum of 32 gig on one of these things. And at 720p, 32 gig's not gonna last you a long amount of time. A few hours to maybe a day if you're lucky. You know, if you turn the resolutions down again and turn the frame rates down, you might be able to get a day's worth of footage out of something like that. So not so great if you're going away for the weekend and you want to want to find out what happened Friday night. Uh, obviously with, a, with one of these ones, the storage is as big as you want it to be and the resolution of your cameras is as high as you can afford it to be. You might only need 1080p cameras or you might need 4K ones. If your budget's there, you can have those options with a pro install product. Some of these small devices will also have cloud storage options. Um, that's easy enough to do. Hook them into an Amazon Web Services cloud-based storage through whatever it is. They might archive it to Dropbox or to something else like that. Or the manufacturer may have their own cloud storage online somewhere in the other side of the world. That's great for a consumer. But the short side of it is most of the packages that come with these are either subscription or they have multiple levels of subscription depending on how many hours or days worth of storage you want. So it might come with free 12 hours worth of storage, but if you want two days, that'll cost you seven bucks a month. If you want a week, that'll cost you $14 a month and so on and so on beyond that one. It's a good way of keeping a revenue stream going for a manufacturer of a product, but for a consumer that takes it home might not realize that that's what they're signing up for to do it that way. Um, most pro install products do not have cloud storage and there's a very, very good reason for that. 
security. Um, yeah, there are so many different ways to cause problems with a, an internet connection. The Telnet attacks that happened last year took down a couple of fairly major manufacturers of these things and turned fridges into attack vectors for you know, danger on the internet. The internet of things devices and the security of them will become much more important as we go along. So these sort of devices that are built to a 150 Australian dollar budget we know that they didn't cost that coming out of the factory. If you're, buying, you're doing it to that sort of level, are you getting the result that you want? Are you getting the security that you want that means that your camera isn't going to be used to bring down the Pentagon and have somebody coming around and knocking on your door? So cloud storage on a professional level system isn't put in for a very simple reason. They don't want to deal with that rubbish. They'd rather have good storage for it. Um, you can actually, in some cases, do it this way, and you can secure it if you really, really, really know what you're doing. Um, I don't know enough about that, so I'm not going to tell you exactly how it works, but come along in a couple of weeks, I might have more info. In terms of the setup for these, obviously, the consumer level products win. They are much simpler, much less cabling, much less hassles, generally it's just plug in, off you go. These ones, well, running cables, installing the cameras, plugging them into the recorder, setting up the recorder, putting a hard drive in, it, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So this tends to be something that you pay a lot more for than this one because you're getting somebody else generally to do this for you. And limited expansion on this one versus, well, your budget's the only restriction here. If you want 164 cameras around a one-room apartment, you can do it if you really, really want to. It's possible. Your budget's going to have to be interesting, and I don't really know why you're live streaming that much of your, uh, your life, but, you know, good luck to you. All right, so let's look a little bit more into the pro-level stuff and look at kits versus custom-made. So the majority of our sales up until this point have been custom systems. Understanding what your customer wants and exactly what they want to do and then designing the system to match those requirements exactly. That means that your customer gets what they need or what they can afford to do as much as they need. Versus a kit, which is a great way of spending not a lot of money to get a result out of it. The result may not be exactly what you're looking for, but it might be good enough. Or it might be perfect. If you're the one customer that that kit's exactly designed for and you put your cameras in the right spot and you deal with the restrictions and the cabling and everything else like that for it, that kit might be the absolute perfect product for you. It's also a great introduction to CCTV systems. A kit is a really cheap way of getting a result and going, I like this, but I think I could do better in future. And a couple of years down the track, upgrade, change over, change the cameras, do something more with it. Well, the kit's a good way to start that off. We do two main kits at the moment with the third just added recently. So an AHD kit. So four cameras, recorder, hard drive, cabling, network cable, power supplies, everything's all included in one brown box. That's an IP8 channel kit. Same sort of idea, but with more cameras. And in the AHD kit, at least, you end up with a little camera like this one. So I'm just going to unplug it from here. And I apologise for my uh, stuffy nose and the rest of it. It's coming down off a cold. But this is the camera that comes as part of the AHD kit, and the IP camera one is almost identical. Different type of cabling, of course. Um, this is a great little 1080p camera. It's outdoor rated, so it'll sit up on a wall very happily in rain, hail or shine. It also has a 1080p sensor and a 3.6mm fixed lens. So what it is out of the box is what it becomes on your job site. It stays exactly the way it is there. There's no focus, there's no zoom. The zoom is manual in that you move where the camera is to get a manual zoom. You can't change anything about the camera itself. So for a lot of environments that's perfect, but for other people, if you want to capture that license plate of somebody coming out of a driveway, you might have to put that camera five metres away from the driveway to make that vision possible. So if you deal with those restrictions, a kit's a great way to do it. Um, DIY can be versus do it for me with the pro level stuff typically. One size doesn't quite fit all. That's slightly negative on my part. Um, I actually think kits are quite good versus meeting your needs. I prefer to do it this side of things, but there's a market for both of them. All right, so we've talked about kits in general. 
as well as custom products. So now let's talk about the technology that's behind them. And to do that, I have to introduce all the competing formats because this is the fun part. All right, analog cameras are being discontinued and, and that is happening at the factory level. There's nothing wrong with analog cameras for their generation, for their day, and most analog cameras, if they're put in the right position, can pick up license plates, facial recognition, everything else, because that's what we've done for years and years and years. There's nothing wrong with them. However, if you can upgrade them to something that does 1080p over the same cabling, where before you had a quarter of that resolution, or an eighth, or a sixteenth, or a whatever of that resolution, well, suddenly now that same camera positioning can see a lot more detail in what's going on. And that makes a huge difference. So, we have changed over our primary product range from analog to AHD. AHD stands for Analog High Definition, simple as that. HDSDI is pretty uncommon these days. It was designed as a broadcast format. In other words, trying to run really high resolutions through a HDMI cable is not great, but running it through a coaxial cable is much, much easier because they can be flexible and whatever else. They came into the CCTV world, made a bit of an impact, and they've kindly dropped out. They are a little bit more dependent on cable quality, and so you know, coax cables like this sort of thing would cause all kinds of problems for an SDI signal. Whereas with some of these other ones, you can still get away with this. It meant that retrofitting old installs if the coax was rubbish meant HDSDI would fail or be patchy. HDCVI and TVI are still 1080p formats, typically. CVI is a proprietary one. Uh, it's owned by Dahua. They're, you know, that factory makes CVI gear. That's, you know, they own the patents for it all. So if you see a CVI product, it's going to have some Dahua stuff in there. If you're happy with that, that's great. But you can't interconnect other products into it because it doesn't work that way. HD TVI is another format similar to AHD, just a different way of doing the same sort of idea. The formats are not interchangeable, although some devices will let you switch internally between them. And then, of course, my favourite, which is IP. It has its drawbacks, which I'll get into, but IP is still there. Obviously, the biggest market for the coax uh, the coax types of high resolution ones are existing coax. You've run an analog system throughout your building 20 years ago when the building was made. It's going to be bloody difficult to get in there now and run new data cables to make that happen. So use the existing coax, push AHD or HDCVI or HDTVI through it and you've gone from yeah, low res to high res in one foul swoop. You replace the cameras, replace the recorder and the cabling, that massive cost stays exactly the same important. Um, you can of course run data cable if you're running a new uh, if you're running a new one and with data cable you can use balance to convert between data cable and video and power. Pretty simple. Um, most of you have sold these and know of them so I'm not going to hand that one around but how many of you remembered that you can run IP over coax? This is a little bit of a different one. We don't sell that many of them. I'd like to sort of change that around a little bit. Using your existing coax cabling to turn it into a LAN cable is actually a really, really useful feature. This thing can go, I think, about 200 metres, and that, again, is something that a normal data cable can't do. 100 metres is your maximum data length for PoE and for normal data. This thing can do 200 over coax. So it has a really, really useful market. There's nothing particularly crazy about it. It's not very expensive. But there are a lot of jobs out there where this will make a lot of sense. So upgrading from an analogue system or even AHD or the rest up to IP can be done with one of these. Big problem is you don't have power. So you're still going to have to locally power it with a PoE injector or something like that for the camera, but it's an option. Right? Um, my recommendation if you're doing something new is to run data cable. Even if you're running AHD or the others, use balance because IP is more likely to be the future of this technology rather than the coax based ones. Coax is a bit like um, the two wire systems that iPhone run for video and audio. There are better ways to do it, but if only, you've only got bell wires running through a building that's two wires, well now you can run video and audio where before it was just a ding dong. It's the same sort of idea with these as well. All right, moving across. Actually, I wanted to add one more thing to this too. Um, the biggest drawback to IP cameras and systems is networking and speed, and those two are interrelated. 
So if you're watching a live event, let's say you're in a, a nightclub and you're in the security office and somebody's taking a swing at somebody else and you want to get your guards to that guy now because they weren't right next to him, they can't stop him, they're over there and they didn't see it. If you direct them towards him, but there's a 30 second gap between him taking a swing and the cameras actually sending that information through the network and you seeing it, suddenly 30 seconds becomes 45 to a minute or more before these guys can respond and what was one punch is now 12 and six people are involved and off you go. So in those kind of mission critical speed is important things, upgrading the network into the sky with money may help or running AHD or HDTVI or CVI, one of those other formats may be the perfect example for it. So just keep that in mind when you're specking these out for a customer. There are reasons why you might prefer an AHD system or one of the others over an IP camera system. If you don't know a lot about networking, certainly AHD and uh, HDTVI and so on is much more friendly as well. All right, so resolution stuff. Most of you have seen this before because I've done it at other training sessions. Our analog cameras lived up here. Low resolutions, pretty simple, worked really well. However, IP camera systems and AHDs and the rest tend to live and start here. Move to the 2 megapixel, 3 megapixel, 5 and up to 4K and beyond. This is where a lot of this technology is going and I'll talk a little bit later about what Radio Parts is going to do and what DOS is going to do in terms of cameras and recorders in future as well. But you can quite clearly see that if you can take a analog cable that's feeding that sort of signal through now and replace it with AHD ones that are running 1080p, that's a huge difference in terms of the image quality that you're getting out the other end. And recognition is a very easy thing with a 1080p system, not so good with the other ones. All right, this is the boring, boring, boring slide, but it's important to know about lens sizes and what they can actually see. I've got three different sensor sizes here because cameras can have different sensor sizes and that affects how the lenses work as well. Let's take a more standard size of one over three inch. There is also one over two eighths and one over two sevenths. We've got some of these. But take the one over three, a 2.8 millimeter lens, 95 degrees or so field of view. And right up at the 12 millimeter end, you're down to 23. So a camera like this one, this is an AHD camera. It's got a 2.8 to 12 millimeter very focal lens. Can do anywhere from about 95 down to 23 degrees. That means it's a much more versatile camera than say that 3.6 that I handed around that is fixed at 77 degrees no matter what you do. You can't see that degree or more that you might need just to capture the edge of your yard with that camera. So to give you some real life examples, <clears throat> in the car park yesterday, Analog, D1 camera resolution and my car. You have no idea who I work for. You'd be hard pressed to know that that's a Mondeo, except if you're really, really car mad and know the shape of the rear headlights, uh, rear lights. You've got no idea what my number plate is or any detail about cars in the background. There's one down there that looks kind of red and there's one that kind of looks gray, but that's about it. That's what a D1 resolution from that range at that wide angle can do. Changing that to a 1080p version of the same thing, the difference is huge. Now, on a higher resolution monitor than on here, you can clearly see what my number plate is and who I work for. But again, it's a fairly small part, you can see, of that overall image. So even at 1080p, it's not the priority of this camera. This camera is there to capture everything happening from the guys loading the van in the background to the different types of cars that are here, a bit more information about this one and so on. Versus that same camera now scaled right into a 12 millimeter N where you can see that I work for Rudio parts and I, my number plate and everything else that's there. That is a license plate recognition camera at that level very, very easily. Okay, so placement, resolution and angle, the three killer features for what you want to see versus what you're actually going to get out of the end of it. Okay? Right. So, let's look at a consumer level camera. This is an equivalent of that little TP-Link one that I handed around. It's from a different brand, but it's a 720p camera in daylight, and it goes down to 480 lines at night time. Little, basic little system, and this is my front door somewhere here. Um, there's 
something here, there's something here, and that's the aliens coming down to take me away, quite clearly. Um, there's no infrared, there's no night vision, although this camera quotes excellent night vision. You can see what you can see. If somebody walked up to the front door there, it would be quite a dark shadow that you're looking at. If I go out and turn sensor lights on, suddenly the camera starts to actually perform properly. And you can see there's my car, and there's a front window, and there's the bottle brush, and there's the moon up in the background as well. So much, much simpler to install a sensor light for a crappy camera than it is to try and do a lot of other things to make the image fix. And a sensor light can put people off as well, the same way that and now seeing the infrareds glowing off a camera will. But yes, I thought that was an interesting little example for a real life one at least. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just got something caught in my throat there. What I wanted to talk to you now about was nighttime viewing in general. So nighttime viewing on a camera the camera's only as good as how much light it can pick up. The bigger the sensor is, the more light, or the less light it actually needs to make the image look good. There are ways though of turning a perfect night into something a lot better. Infrared is the common one, we've been doing it for years. Increasing the sensor size is another great way of doing it, but you know, you end up with a camera that's this size to try and see what's going on. Infrareds have their own little problems, but there's a new technology called StarViz or Starlight Cameras. It's called a lot of other things. Dark Fighter, I think, is the Dahua version of the same thing. It's a chipset that enables you to see what's going on in pure night or almost pure night with very, 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 very easy ability right down into color. And that's quite an important thing for a lot of sites. So Wayne and Bilgen put this little one together, so I'm just going to play this little video for you now. And this is on our YouTube page for anybody who wants to show it off. Today is introduction video of our latest Starbase IP cameras. Starbase IP cameras are used to the latest Starlight technology, which is designed to give you a colored and sharp image, even during low light conditions. Unlike the traditional IP cameras that use the infrared when there's not enough light, Starlight IP cameras do um, gives you a colored image during low light conditions. The infrared on Starlight cameras only gives you when there's absolutely no light, zero lux. So I just want to pause this for one second. He's going to go into a, a video example from here, but. This is obviously a very, very fake image. You know, you've got, look, cheetahs and look, nothing. That's not so good. This one's an actual one from the factory itself. You can see that at pure dark, there's no detail in this image whatsoever. Whereas over here, we've got full color at the same brightness level. The same amount of light coming into this room, you go from seeing not very much to seeing everything that's there. That's the power of a StarViz camera. So, in our example, here. We've got um, to the left of the screen, that's our latest Starlight IP camera, and to the right of the screen, that's our traditional Dome 30 IP cameras. And um, we've set up both cameras in our storage room, and uh, we've got a light measuring device working from the camera on the shelf, as you can see there. And to the right, bottom right corner of the left screen, you'll be able to see the sensor. So the sensor, the light sensor is sitting pretty much right next to the camera lens. So we can get a pretty accurate reading. But now we can see during rough daylight, which the cut reading is around 257 marks, both cameras giving us a very clear sharp image. Uh, we have to turn the lights off. Now the last reading has gone down to around 8.1. And um, the start camera is still giving a color sharp image, no problems. And the normal traditional IP camera has only switched to infrared, which we can only see a black and white image here. Now we are slowly shutting the door to really keep reducing the light coming to the room. And as you can see on the screen there, the last reading is reducing. Now it's down to 7.5 and it's still having a color sharp image there. And the reading is still reducing while we're talking. 6.8, color image, no problems. If 
Euro as a fixed in, which really indicates zero bucks, which is absolutely not right. That's the only time when Euro Lab kicks in for the Starlight camera. Right, so let's just pause that again for you. So it's quite a clear example. I mean, that's using a stationary cupboard here. Artificial lighting, you know, fluorescent overhead LED tubes, well, LED tubes down to closing the door and nothing going on. That's quite a, an obvious example in a closed environment like that of where it's very useful. Um, in a yard outside with a better background lighting, this thing will probably never go down to dark, you know, into infrared mode at night time. And infrared has a lot of issues with it, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. But certainly a StarViz camera is the solution to a lot of potential problems. However, there are environments where infrared is still important. Um, if you are in a pure dark environment, you have a warehouse, a storage container or something similar to that with no lighting whatsoever, you still need some kind of illumination to make these things work. You know, it has to be some, so infrared is still going to be necessary on those sort of cameras. That's where our StarViz still has it. So it's worth just keeping that in mind when we're looking at these sort of systems too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about infrared in general because it's a question that we get asked a lot and it's something that causes a lot of potential problems. There is such a thing as too much infrared. Don't sell a 50 meter camera if a 30 meter camera will do. Um, too much infrared can cause spotlighting and contrast problems. So, you know, turn on a big spotlight onto a yard and you get no definition between different objects, you just get everything very, very bright. And at night time that means you know, lack of detail and information in the image. If you've got reflective stuff like metal or glass or so on, infrared will come back into the camera and blow it out so you'll see nothing that's going on for it. It's very important to think about the environment the cameras are being put in and the exact vision that they're trying to see to make sure that you get the right camera for the job. I often recommend to people that they go to their house, take a f or their property, take a, cam a photo or with their phone or whatever of the position where you want the camera and also a rough image of what you want the camera to see, what's in that yard, and then put those two images together and go, we're under eaves outside so a dome is probably okay, you've got glass over here so let's make sure we turn this slightly this way so the infrared's not going to cause a problem with it. It's important to look at from that point of view and for your customers as well. If they can prepare that well, then you can design a system for them that's going to work properly. And it's an easy thing to do. Um, working off a plan is a good way to get started, but occasionally you get thrown uh, curveballs. I had a customer in North Queensland who had IR reflective paint on his house. It had metallic uh, oxides in the paint itself designed to reflect the infrared so his house didn't get as hot during the summers that, than it would. And of course, the camera didn't even have to be pointed anywhere near the paintwork for it to blare black into the camera and see nothing. And that fault finding that was a right pain. We had cameras coming backwards and forwards that we could not find a fault with until he took one of them inside to his garage at the same time one of them was outside and swapped the two of them live over and worked out that inside was working fine, outside wasn't, and we started to narrow it down from there. So be a little bit careful about where these things are sold. With cameras like these ones, we obviously separate the infrared from the actual lens, and that should reduce the problems of it coming back in internally, but External IR reflection or spotlights, you know, if you put in motion sensor lights to these ones, well, you can you know, blind them like anything else. Using wide dynamic range and those sort of things to help is definitely important. On a camera like this one, if you bend this camera right around to its edge here, it's getting a different profile than it does when the camera's right up at the top. It might not be as well sealed and so some infrared light might get in. So moving the camera an angle you know, on the wall by putting a chalk behind it or changing the angle here slightly might improve the infrared a huge amount. So it's often about the placement themselves. We design these things as best we can to avoid that problem but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to be perfect all the time. High-end, very expensive cameras, pan, tilt and zooms worth thousands of dollars still have the same infrared internal reflection potential problem. So be a little bit careful how they're used. And when your customers call you up and ask you about it, it's important to qualify what they're actually doing with it all as well. Okay, in terms of the stuff I've got out here, I'm going to do more demos of this live when we're doing the NVR and DVR training in a couple of weeks time. But to give you an idea, this is one of our new 
50 meter IR IP cameras. This one has a very special feature that it has a motorized lens. So we've got this set up in the showroom for you guys to play with anytime you like. But the f idea with it behind a motorized lens isn't necessarily so that you can zoom in and out of it anytime you choose. For an installer, this makes their job really, really easy. Mount this camera, point it roughly at what you want to look at, at that driveway, and then go back inside to the NVR and zoom in exactly to the range that you want it to be. Get the focus and everything right from inside rather than twiddling two little screws on the outside on the device itself to make it work. It can save and install a lot of time and it doesn't cost a lot more to get in a camera itself. The Starviz camera again doesn't cost a lot more than a normal one but it gives you options that a normal uh, dome camera won't have. There are options from, well this is the Ness kit. We were talking about kits before. This is a HD TVI camera. So this is obviously quite an entry level camera. Runs coax and power, DC power, same as anything else, and a 1080p sensor that's on it. I'll hand that round for you to have a bit of a look. It's not very heavy. It's plastic for the most part. So inside it's perfect. Outside under E, again, not a bad idea. And for the money that we spent on those kits, they're ridiculously good value. Compare that with plastic bodied IP camera. This one's got an infrared window and a camera window. They separate the two to reduce the problem. Again, plastic bodied one megapixel camera, oh, sorry, two megapixel camera for outside use, perfect. Great little product. It's got local power and it's got PoE power for it. And this brings up something quite important about these systems and cabling them and everything else that comes out of it. The cables that work for these can be coax plus power or it can be data cables. Data cables are my preferred option, CAT6 for preference, CAT6A if you really want to future proof yourself or avoid any shielding or noise issues and other things like that with it. Obviously running balance to get that working properly is great. We power works really really simply for the most part. Some IP cameras are not like other IP cameras, the ones that are in our kit and are non-standard, they use a different type of voltage and things like that for it, so they work with that kit only, and most kit products are the same sort of idea. It's a bit strange, but that's the way they go. It's a way of saving a little bit of money and making sure that you buy the same cameras again every time you do it. Um, last few things I want to mention. There are charts like this one available from the police as well as from manufacturers specific for it like Vidi Labs. If you're an installer, taking one of these out on site and using this to determine whether night vision's working properly, whether you can actually see the license plate that you're looking for or whatever else is a very, very important thing to have. And the Australian Police and New Zealand Police have standards for facial recognition and license plate recognition. So I encourage you to have a closer look at the images when I send this through and you'll get an idea of exactly what you're trying to look for. I talked about power options before, so I'm not gonna go back through that. But I did wanna say, when you're cabling these systems, you can run wireless from building to building with an IP camera system quite easily. So having four cameras over on a building 100 metres away and the NVR and the recorder back in the main shed, definitely possible. We've done that multiple times using things like the Ubiquiti nano beam range really, really simply to make it work. So I would, yeah, there are options for you if you can't run cables at all. Um, certainly more that way than in IP than there is with the AHD stuff. And I'm going to put a big word in for one of my favourite products that we just do not sell enough of. This is the T700A meter. This thing is a beast CCTV testing. The ML700. No, this is its replacement. Much, much better. The T700A has got a battery on board, obviously, a seven inch touchscreen on the front, and it can take pretty much any format of camera currently available and display it, test it, specify it, and do everything else that you want to do. It has PoE power on board for ethernet. It can take an SDI camera to an analog camera without any issue and power them up at the same time. So if you're up on the wall fixing the position for something, then this is a perfect tool for that as well. Same with IP. You can do RS-485, it's even got a tiny little LED light in it as well, so you can use it to light up your roof space if you need it. Um, it does data cable testing, it supplies 
Uh, yeah, it supplies a whole heap of other things as well. You can even plug this into a network and use it to view cameras through a network rather than cameras directly. It is a network tester and DHCP and, 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 yeah, ridiculously good value. And it takes storage. Retail, and I think it's about $1,000, $9.99 or thereabouts. There are some excellent trade prices for it, um, but this is one that any serious CCTV installer should have in their bag with them all the time. Um, we have cheaper meters that are designed for pan, tilt and zoom only or ethernet only, ones with Wi-Fi in them, ones that just do analog cameras and so on. They're still very valuable. A lot of our IP cameras still come with an analog output. So you can locally power them up, set up the zoom and focus and then plug in the data cable and be done with it. That's a simultaneous feed. I can also use this to modulate a video signal throughout a building and view this camera in low res on every single TV if I wanted to. Not every camera is that way. You can have a look at that, T uh, that UniView 1 and some of the others that are here. They don't have that secondary output, they just have the one. Um, right, let's move on to the last couple of things I wanted to mention. So, we are obviously upgrading and changing our range. We always do that. We want to be as close to the forefront as we can be without getting stuff that's going to have problems. So we're looking at new IP cameras. We always are. We're looking at high resolution ones, but there is a very important point to make that higher resolution does not equal better. A 4 megapixel camera with an inferior processor in it is going to look worse than a 2 megapixel sensor with a better processor. And that the guys have seen when they went to the factories in China. You can improve, this, you know, improve the firmware, improve the hardware to the point where a 4 megapixel will be much, much better. But that takes some time to get right. And there is another big problem when you start dealing with much higher resolution gear. And that is how you actually get that signal through a network. Currently, our IP cameras are H.265. Our recording on the hard drives is a H. Sorry, H.264 everywhere on the network and through the cameras themselves. There is a push to move to H.265 for the higher resolution ones, just to be able to get that data through the network as compressed as possible. The problem with that is, if you compress it in the middle, the network's fine. It loves it. Not, not much data to deal with. At either end, though, the processor in the camera and the processor in the recorder have to do a hell of a lot more work. And there are plenty of examples of gear that's designed for H.265 that runs 20 or 30 degrees Celsius hotter because it's doing H.265 rather than other stuff. I don't know if any of you have played with some of the media players at home or NAS drives with media encoding or the rest of it, but you'll notice that when they're running one of those big chunky H.265 files, they get red hot. So that technology will change and update and whatever over the years, but for now, we're looking at it, we'll test out a H.265 recorder and the high-res cameras will need to be able to run that way. The new recorders will also have the ability to do IQ and smart analysis. So this is something we've got to test out, obviously, but the idea being that instead of basic motion detection, in other words, this pixel moved, therefore motion goes off. So a flag waved, a leaf moved in the breeze, motion detection's gone. With these ones, we'll be able to set things like a barrier. So if something moves beyond this barrier, then that's a motion detection event. So that could be your car in your driveway, or that could be somebody leaving a briefcase at a station. That could be uh, somebody walking where they're not supposed to be. All that sort of thing is possible. People counting and so on, all these sorts of ideas in theory are possible with it. Once the firmware has been tested and once the NVRs have been tested properly, then we'll start getting them in and working on them that way. Um, and we're getting a new StarViz camera with the motorized lens. The original ones were supposed to have the motorized lens, but they did not. So the next generation will have that. They'll also have an audio input. So if you want to put a microphone to the signal and then get it through the IP network, you can do it that way as well. With the AHD range, we obviously use a universal AHD, so any of our cameras will work with any AHD recorder out there, and any other cameras will work with our AHD recorder, which is lovely. But our hybrid has the ability to do analog or AHD and IP. It's a three format version. The 
Next generations of those can go up to five. So we add the analog and HD and IP from before, but we can do HD TVI and HD CVI as well or alternatively. So upgrade paths are a lot easier for people that have mixed camera systems. All right, those are the basic things I wanted to talk about. Are there any specific questions about cameras or systems? The NVRs and the remote access and so on, I'm gonna you know, handle in two weeks time when we do that. But in terms of the general stuff I've talked about today, have you got anything that your customers ask that you want to know? Um, with the, yeah. we were talking about your customer in North Queensland and dealing with the IR sure. paint issue. Would the Starfish chipset count like that? So yes. The IR on the switches on there's no ambient on. Correct, it will. So yeah, that would be a solution. Yep. So long as you get into the software for these things or through the menus or whatever else and turn off the infrared altogether. So set it to colour mode, set it to day mode all the time, then Starviz and potentially will give you no problems from that sort of environment. What we did for him was actually quite simple. He put sensor lights in and turned the infrared off and it works perfectly from that point onwards. But yeah, um, certainly Starviz has application for that sort of thing. Um, yes, anything else? With um, Ben, so CBI, how come we got some installs that just all they use is CBI? Is it, that, sure. is it just personal preference? Or yeah, I think so. Um, it's hard to swipe them to swipe them. Yeah, of course. It, it's really difficult to get anybody to go from one format that they're comfortable with to anything else. Because if I know the software and the firmware on these as well as I do, I can over the phone in three seconds tell you to go here, 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 and then click this, and then you're done with it. Your installer wants to be done with that question as fast as possible because he's not getting paid for it, you know. When the, somebody's calling up with a support problem, he wants to know what it is and be fixing it in a second. We've stabilised the software on these for the last few generations so that our installers know them and are familiar with them. But if you started doing HD CVI because it was the only option to do 1080p easily and you kept installing HD CVI because they work through the bugs, they work through the kinks, and now the software is reliable and the cameras are good and there's options for it. It's getting somebody to change away from that is a really tough thing. You'd have to have a feature that you can't do with HDCVI. So, IP is generally where those people start to come across. Because take something like a, a fisheye camera or a 180 degree view camera on a ceiling. I can put a 10 megapixel camera up on the ceiling with a gigantic wide fisheye lens on it and see the entire area in our showroom in one vision, one image. If I do the processing right, I can split that up into four images and flatten those surfaces so it's as if I've got four cameras in one. I've got one cable run, but I've got four sets of images all at 1080p or greater coming through the thing. That's one camera to do the job of four and generally the one camera is cheaper than the four cameras would be. Or you don't have an option with HD CVI to do full pan, tilt and zoom the way you want to over one data cable or some other feature that their customer wants that you just can't do with that option. When that happens, be the person that's there to say, great, you know, you've done this all these years, let's support you and look after you on this one and see if you're comfortable and happy with that. And if they are, then they might start moving across to it. Um, I, you know, if you get into political discussions with anybody, you'll know how difficult it is to change their mind. When it comes to a product they spend eight to ten hours a day on every day, it's the same sort of problem too. So, so this is TVI, isn't it? TVI in the Nest ones, yeah, absolutely. Um, one last thing, I guess, on the IP stuff as well. Our cameras run typically on the on a proprietary protocol called i8 or i8H or one of those sort of things. If you want to add in cameras like that UniView one that I handed around to the same network. Switch all the cameras over to OnViv, use OnViv through the recorder and everything can be viewable at the same time. It doesn't enable some of the fast search features and things that, you know, when you're using i8H or i8 on its own. But if you want people that have got that camera from that manufacturer, that one from that one, that one from that one, that one from that one, turn them all onto OnViv's profile and hopefully it'll be the same profile for all of them or similar enough that the recorder will pick it up and work with it. At home, I've got uh, eight cameras running with, uh, I think, six different manufacturers on a different manufacturer's NVR, and they're all working perfectly on OnViv. So, yeah, it's important to know and important to think about for your customers as well. They can upgrade and change if they want to. Some of the cheaper cameras can have OnViv capabilities. That's true too. Yeah, a lot of the ones that you find in kits aren't on the standard. They are whatever their proprietary thing is, and they're done deliberately because they're easier to sell as a kit because of that. 
Um, an I-81 can be automatically searched and added through the network. The entry-level SWAN kits or insert brand name of whatever you like here will often run that way. And they've done it deliberately because it means less questions, less problems. But if you want to upgrade or change it, you've got to buy a, a camera from the same model. Same as the IP kit here. So, same idea. Very good.